I'm Ryan Kennedy, editor at PV Magazine at USA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back live from Brooklyn, New York, to today's event, the PV Magazine Roundtables US 2023. Energy storage is ramping up at the grid scale to meet an energy mix increasingly dominated by renewables. The US set a new quarterly record for deployment in Q2 this year, installing 1.7 gigawatts and 5.6 gigawatt hours of storage for an average of three hours of duration. This relatively young industry is expected to continue to achieve new quarterly highs for deployment for years to come. Over 66 gigawatts of energy storage is expected to come online through 2027, 83% of which will be at the grid scale. How? We'll discuss next. On this panel, we'll talk to industry leaders about the roles that grid scale energy storage serves and the various ways that it can deliver value. We'll identify current barriers to growth and suggest strategies to overcome these challenges. We'll also explore emergent alternative technologies in the grid scale storage space. I'd like to introduce our panel. We are joined by Darlene DeRosa, Vice President of Policy and Regulatory Affairs, STEM Incorporated. STEM is a leader in AI-driven clean energy solutions and services. We're also joined by George Hirschman, Chief Executive Officer of Solve Energy, one of the leading utility scale solar and energy storage developers in the United States. Please also welcome Gabe Murtaugh, Director of Markets and Technology for the Long Duration Energy Storage Council. Gabe focuses on market changes, accelerating long duration energy storage adoption pathways, and project map tracking, mapping, and research. And joining us from Wood Mackenzie is Vanessa Witt, Senior Research Analyst. Vanessa is an expert analyst in the front of meter battery energy storage. Welcome and thank you panelists for offering your expertise today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. And uh, we'll start off with George here. Uh, solar and energy storage across all sectors is expected to begin realizing the benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act in the coming years. What's the most meaningful benefit to a utility scale solar and storage developer mm -hmm. like Solve Energy? So, um, uh, you know, for some of the obvious reasons that um, that solar allows us to address some of the reliability concerns um, that we often hear uh, around renewables. I think solar really addresses those. Um, what we're what we're seeing is the benefits that are being addressed across the, the country. Um, if we look at areas specific to kind of the West and, you know, California, where we do a lot of our work, um, we're seeing obviously that that storage addresses some of the duck curve and challenges that we have in um, the power sector today. Um, one of the, other things that we see in really high irradiance areas is that it limits the requirement to curtail in a lot of our, you know, kind of California and Arizona markets and allows us to use that energy when it's most needed. Um, and then I think that, you know, we're seeing areas where distribution um, is a challenge as well. So um, we're seeing a lot of infill storage in urban areas where we need energy at the point of use. And so, you know, while a lot of our projects are solar plus storage, we're also seeing a lot of standalone storage in urban areas as we, as we really electrify the fleet um, of, of vehicles and um, short duration transportation that obviously is affects a lot of the the coastal regions and ports where we're um, where we're looking to electrify those that fleet of transportation. We have a lot of new load in concentrated areas. So I think the with IRA we're seeing that you know ITC is uh, that um, investment tax credits can be used on standalone storage. So that's a big mover in the market as well. 
Thanks, George. And uh, the next question here is for Darlene. Uh, a lot of excitement has been around the direct pay provision within the IRA. Um, and some have said that it has opened the door for mar more markets to participate in grid scale storage. How has it done that? Very much so. We're seeing um, nationally direct pay unlock um, munis uh, markets and certainly probably the biggest of all um, rural electric co-ops. Um, so if you think about pre-IRA, none of these tax credits were available to nonprofit um, organizations. So municipalities, um, rural electric co-ops, which are member owned, completely different model than, for example, a, a investor owned utility. And so once direct pay passed, this really just changed the game for these organizations in terms of how they were thinking about adopting energy storage to support their grid. And so to give you some perspective on really the size of, of populations that they're serving, rural electric co-ops serve about 42 million people across the country. Um, and about 92% of those people are located in what's called persistent poverty counties. So really direct pay is not only moving the needle on storage adoption at the grid scale, but it's also bringing, you know, pulling in that policy lever that IRA was really focused on as well, which is, um, you know, bringing the entire country writ large um, on this journey of, of updating the grid. So, you know, one other, one other point about those, um, those co-ops and what they're looking at is they're just as interested as any other co customer in optimizing those assets, making it work both for their members um, and for their grid. And so they're looking at um, services around siting storage and negotiating contracts and really optimizing with fleet, um, as George mentioned. So, you know, those, those customers are just as sophisticated um, as any other. And it's um, direct pay has really changed that, that game. Great. It's great to hear that direct pay is serving rural communities and remote communities who are often, you know, the most exposed to um, climate change effects and power outages. So great to see more energy storage coming into those regions. Um, next for Vanessa, uh, Wood Mackenzie reported an 18% increase in grid scale battery system prices from 2021 to 2022. Uh, is this upward trend in price expected to continue, and how might the IRA change uh, any factors around that in the coming years? Yeah, <clears throat> so throughout 2022, we saw a pretty steady increase in prices, whether you're looking at the battery module level or at the system level. Um, a lot of that was tied to lithium carbonate and the raw materials that go into the cells and the modules. Um, Prices generally peaked in about Q4 of 2022 or potentially early Q1 2023. Um, ever since then, we've been seeing price declines, which I think is a much needed relief to the industry overall. Um, lithium carbonate has declined and the spot and contract pricing. Um, and then subsequently, typically anywhere from like one to three months later, we'll see those same prices, uh, price declines kind of reverberate into the cell and system level. Um, mining and refining has opened up uh, in the raw material sector. So that's really what's loosened up that market a little bit more and allowed those prices to come down. Um, same thing with manufacturing supply uh, for batteries. We're actually predicting that 2023 will end in an oversupply of manufacturing as well as an oversupply of lithium carbonate. So all of those factors are um, very good for the industry as far as pricing is concerned, generally speaking. Um, and like I said, you know, from Q1, for, from that peak through, through now, we've just consistently been hearing about price declines. Um, as far as like the IRA effect, there have been some effects. Um, one is that on an overall level, despite the system prices declining, we have seen some increases in, in other areas. Um, 
certain types of equipment um, have increased in price considerably. And a lot of that centers on medium voltage and high voltage equipment, circuitry, transformers, switch gear, GSU, stuff like that. Um, not only is the procurement lead time extremely long, and, but the, the prices have increased. And that's, it, you know, indirectly due to the IRA, just, just due to the increased demand. Um, the other interesting factor is just with the prevailing wage requirement, we've also heard from some EPCs that their um, their costs have had to increase for various reasons. And that has typically been passed at least some amount through to the developer. So there are some certain chunks within the entire system cost that has increased, but the entire system cost as a whole has decreased and we expect that to continue to decrease. Battery modules make up a large chunk right now of the entire system cost. So as battery modules continue to decline, we're expecting system costs to continue to decline as well. Thank you. And uh, the next question is for Gabe. Uh, the IRA has set aside billions for manufacturing of clean energy technologies. Um, are you seeing supply strain constraints for traditional grid scale batteries? And how might long duration alternatives help uh, deal with these constraints? Yeah, I, you know, <clears throat> I think the IRA is definitely helping with things like this. Um, anytime you're incentivizing, you know, any kind of resource to help decarbonize, um, you know, you're you're advancing policy in the right direction. So I think we're we're extremely appreciative of um, the rules that are coming down from IRA, and I think there's a lot of, you know, government funding at the state level, at the federal level. Um, in fact, there were just a few federal announcements that were made um, last week. So exciting news there in terms of long duration energy storage. Um, but it really is helping to propel this um, long duration industry and we're going to need it. Um, you know, I, I, we, we are utilizing lithium ion storage resources primarily now for um, grid scale applications and uh, they can do the work that is necessary. Uh, but more technology, uh, more different variety of options to choose from if you are a utility and you're thinking about installing storage um, for a four hour duration, for a 10 hour duration, for a 100 hour duration is going to be better for you. It's definitely going to help supply chain issues um, you know, when there are more technologies to choose from um, just, just by nature, the fact that there's, there's more out there uh, that can potentially be supplying a need. Absolutely. And uh, thanks. We'll, we'll circle back over to George now. Um, this is a really hot issue that has been around for a couple years. Um, nearly half the utility scale projects sitting in interconnection queues are, are now co-locating energy storage. Um, what motivates the uh, building of a large solar project as a standalone versus co-location uh, with storage? So sort of motivations behind a, a so solar only battery only or putting the two together? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the great news about renewables in general, whether it's whether it's solar or wind or storage, um, is that demand and economics are are the key drivers, right? There's massive demand for for energy um, all across the US, right, as we decommission uh, traditional energy, we need to replace that. We have growing demand um, due, to, due to EV and kind of electrification of everything. So the, the great news that really industries are built by, by demand and economics, and that's really where this, this industry sits today. So, you know, like you said, you know, nearly half of the utility scale projects, uh, solar projects have storage. I would say our, across our fleet, it's more like 80%. Um, we're seeing storage is almost a must in any large scale solar project. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, the developer customers that we work for really look at demand and, economics. What does the utility offtaker, the com large commercial offtaker need? What's the power profile? And that drives ultimately the economics and the support for projects. So I, you know, I think that 
Well, we are in a great opportunity for recognizing that you know the demand curve is going up. We are also still in a um, a supply chain crunch, right? Vanessa talked about high voltage equipment, right? We're seeing things that are not just specific to the to the generation asset, whether that was you know two year the last couple of years it's been solar solar modules and the difficulty in getting solar modules now and we've seen you know the the challenge around supply chain for for storage equipment and resources what we're really seeing driving out now is um is the need for high voltage equipment there's a massive demand and long lead times and so while we're kind of balancing these two things of utilities and commercial off takers want resources today and new generation and storage we're talking about projects that are 200 weeks out when we talk about lead times for high voltage equipment so it is really a, a bit of a struggle but um you know i think the the good news is that economics are at play right we're not this is not a um, this is not a, a make work program or, or a, or a new kind of startup industry where we're heavy, heavily incentivizing the growth of the industry. This is, this comes down to demand and economics, which will continue to drive the market. Great. And, uh, just to follow on that, um, are you seeing any improvements in the high voltage transformer supply? Um, is IRA stimulating more uh, manufacturing in that space and uh, do we expect more capacity to come online H how is the industry moving to sort of s solve that problem yeah i mean i think we're still coming out of a, a kind of a, a bit of a hangover effect from from covid and um a lot of challenges where utilities are have bought up a massive amount of the capacity so that they have system resilience when you talk about storms in the in the southeast and now northeast and um and wildfires in the west that utilities have been and their infrastructure has been hit very hard so a lot of the capacity that we used to see available whether it was um it was just inventory in the system or you know just capacity availability in the in the manufacturing supply chain um those have been either either all the all the um available inventory has been purchased and the capacity queues have been full so you know i think that there's a lot of discussions about you know opening additional lines and doing those things I think um, we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that free up. Um, you know, the the IRA unfortunately did not address every you know piece of equipment in a renewable energy project, right? It really addressed the you know major components that you think about, kind of headline components. Didn't really address the um, high voltage equipment, so. There's been a lot of discussions about how do you, you know, how do you fit that in? Can you use uh, 45X, you know, some manufacturing credits and other things to to address those components and help support the industry? Um, because that's where the the kind of supply chain is now fallen down a bit. And unfortunately, that wasn't really viewed necessarily as a, a renewable um, manufacturing component. I think there's some things and potentially some some fixes and opportunities, but those discussions are moving forward as we're seeing such an impact that we have today. Thank you. And uh, now pivoting to more about what batteries are doing, what functions they're serving. Um, Darlene, uh, what are some of the ways, uh, in addition to um, serving peak demand and 
uh, uh, base load energy support. What are some ways that front of the meter storage is, is being coordinated to serve the grid today? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, if you've been in energy storage for, you know, longer than five minutes, you've heard, um, you've heard the, the phrase that energy storage is the Swiss Army knife of the grid. Um, so it's a bit of a cliche, I think, because it's true. Um, one of the key strengths of energy storage is its flexibility. Um, and so, you know, George talked about, and he is 100% correct, both the, the power, um, the demand and the economics of, uh, you know, solar plus storage is one of the biggest polls that we're seeing. Um, another grid centric um, factor that that's developing and that is really picking up speed again coming out of the IRA is what the standalone storage investment tax credit um, enabled. So previously, storage had to charge from solar in order to receive tax credits. And so that made sense in a lot of ways. Um, and that still makes sense lots of times um, in terms of how grid scale deployments are happening. But there are times when that's not the best solution. Sometimes, really, there's two reasons we see that. Sometimes it's around just space constraints. Um, and sometimes it's around just good old fashioned, you know, unfavorable tariffs um, for solar in, in certain places. So decoupling that where now obviously the energy storage on its own, the economics are, you know, greatly improved with a standalone ITC, but from a grid scale perspective, now you're also decoupling the decision on where to place that storage on the grid and it becomes a grid centric decision. And so you're seeing the storage start to get deployed, you know, for example, um, at specific nodes in order to, to free up congestion um, and to serve those sorts of functions. So that's that's really another, um, another huge benefit that we're seeing from policy really opening up um, and, and thinking about the grid writ large and what, what it needs as we're moving forward into the next decade and, and well beyond. Thanks. And uh, to follow on that, um, you mentioned batteries being placed at nodes. Um, could you speak to sort of the, the advantage that that brings, maybe from a, a cost perspective around uh, transmission and distribution costs as, as the grid begins to age across the U.S.? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a few things. You know, George mentioned the drivers that developers look at, right? I mean, that's one of our audiences and customer uh, customer bases that we sell to as well. And as developers are building their projects and pricing those out, they want to be able to use that asset and deploy that asset in as many ways as possible. Um, you know, that can be anything from, you know, trading in the energy markets and the wholesale markets um, and also offering grid services, which are you know, things like um, grid congestion release, relief um, and also, you know, sort of traditional storage services like balancing the grid and, um, you know, those things that you sort of ancillary services that you traditionally think of with storage. So when you start factoring in those other broader um, benefits, um, th that's where you're able to use that asset and, and make the most of that investment in multiple different ways, including previous ways, but, but new ways like grid congestion and deploying very specifically um, to get those benefits. Thank you. And uh, now moving to Gabe, um, long duration energy storage, there's a lot of new technologies uh, being developed in this space, but it's actually been around for a long time. Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through a little bit of the history of how long duration storage has been used and then how might that change as we have uh, an increasingly renewables powered grid? Yeah, uh, thanks Patrick. This is actually my favorite question, um, so I love this. And and maybe before I <clears throat> dive too deeply in here, I might um, 
just respond a little bit to Darlene's comment. Uh, stir the pot a little bit if I can here. Um, I am not such a big proponent of the existing ITC rules that are in place. Um, you know, I understand the idea that, gee, if you're charging and there's an on-site solar resource that's generating, um, yeah, effectively you are, you know, quote unquote, charging green electrons. Um, but the way that you really determine the storage resources impact on the grid and on emissions is by thinking about a counterfactual between, gee, what would the grid have done with the storage resource in place and what would the grid have done without the storage resource in place? And oftentimes, you know, even in the California markets, um, unless you're seeing zero dollar prices, which there are a fair amount of in the spring, um, you know, most of the time what those storage resources are actually displacing is, you know, some sort of inexpensive natural gas fire generation. And it's really not, you know, uh, you know, just be just because electrons are coming from uh, solar, you know, uh, the the reason why these things are helping to decarbonize, they're helping to decarbonize because when they're discharging later in the day, they're offsetting, you know, very inefficient natural gas, even though they may be charging from, you know, effect effectively marginal natural gas earlier in the day. Um, long discussion there. So where are we with long duration energy storage and this sort of evolution of decarbonizing. Um, I think early on, you know, I, I think about um, decarbonization as sort of a parabolic curve. As you are initially decarbonizing from, ze from 0 percent to 1 percent to 2 percent to 10 percent, um, you're sort of on that flat part of the curve and it's relatively easy to get big wins. Um, as you start to get to the 20 percent, 30 percent, the winds start to get tougher and you have to be more strategic about what you do. As you get to 50 to 60%, um, things get even tougher and you have to make even more um, you know, thoughtful decisions about what you're procuring and why. And then once you get to you know, 70, 80, 90%, um, you've got to be very prescriptive about what you're building and why you're building it, or otherwise um, you won't get effectual outcomes. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Early on, um, if you've got a, a, a grid that you're operating primarily, you know, coal and natural natural gas fired resources, so carbon emitting uh, generation, and you want to decarbonize, if you add, a, you know, a one megawatt solar resource or a one megawatt wind resource, um, you're going to get benefits from that because every time those resource that resource is running, the renewable resource, um, you're effectively offsetting. You could potentially be offsetting your most polluting resource. Um, you know, you build 10 times that amount of capacity, 10 megawatts, 100 megawatts, and you're still doing the same thing. Anytime those resources are running, obviously you're displacing um, the natural gas emitting resources. Once you get to the point, though, where some of the time those resources uh, may be ineffective because you've got all the generating capacity that you need from natural gas fired resources, you suddenly need another solution. You either need another renewable solution or you need storage. Um, storage can obviously capture that energy that's being generated from renewables, and then you can move that energy uh, to the time of the day when you're going, going to be using it and it's going to be uh, effective and used to serve load. Um, that problem gets even more complicated as you move towards you know, 30% decarbonized, 40% decarbonized, and suddenly instead of just needing you know, two hour duration, four hour duration storage resources, you need 10 hour duration storage resources or 20 hour duration storage resources. And they're doing the job of potentially covering for multiple days when the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, um, or uh, you're expecting very high loads, things like that. And the four hour duration resources just simply wouldn't be enough in terms of energy. So megawatt hours aren't sufficient um, to cover shortfalls in um, planning. Now, um, you know, obviously the, the solar generation is um, occurring for eight, 10, maybe 12 hours a day. Um, so if you're thinking about a winter period when you're getting eight hours of good sunlight, um, you're obviously gonna need generation for the other um, you know, 16 hours of the day. So uh, a simple four hour duration battery is probably not the right choice there. You probably need something that's 16 hours. Um, as you get to nearly full decarbonization, um, you do have to have solutions like 100 hour uh, duration batteries somewhere in that neighborhood. So you can actually move energy from season to season. So from the fall season to the winter season, from the spring season to the summer season um, to help bridge gaps there. 
there. Obviously, we've got a long way to go to get there. Um, but if we're thinking about decarbonizing by 2040, 2045, something like that, some of those targets are really a lot closer than we think. So we need to start deploying and thinking about these deployments today. Excellent. Thank, thank you for that thoughtful response. Uh, we'll, we'll turn it over now to Vanessa. Um, grid scale storage is expected to represent about 83% of the capacity added through 2027. Uh, what accounts for the difference in demand for distributed storage versus front of the meter? And do we also see strong demand for distributed despite that uh, difference in, in uh, share? Yeah, absolutely. So that 83% um, of it, it, it's just in, it, it's good to know that that's capacity. Um, so starting with front of the meter, um, you know, two, even just two years ago, these projects were um, easily a normal project, 20 to 50 megawatts. And nowadays, um, easily three figures, 100 to 200, 400 megawatts. So the volume of projects from the meter um, have just gotten increasingly larger. And obviously these are, you know, going right to the grid, right to those transmission um, high voltage lines. And that's serving a utilities integrated resource plan, or you have a developer or an IPP taking advantage of the merchant market and taking advantage of an offtake contract that's likely going to also be with a utility. So that's really driven the demand and also the really high percentage of capacity in the front of the meter market. Um, when you're looking at distributed, that's going to be made up with your residential systems and your community and commercial and industrial. Um, so CNI generally, you know, the, it, again, it's behind the meter, so it's going to be hooked up to distribution, generally speaking, and um, it's typically serving that individual's load. Um, those customers are looking for bill savings and demand charge um, reductions. Um, so it's a very different use case. And it, similarly with, with residential as well, where residential could um, serve as backup. Um, you can play with the grid with time of use and some sort of net metering, with whichever states continue to have that. Um, so the end use is, is much different, but that's really what, you know, utility IRPs and um, developers and IPPs building these really large projects um, because of the returns that are available are really driving that difference in capacity. I mean, if you looked at um, number of projects, you'd see a uh, larger, much larger number of projects in residential, which makes sense, you know, uh, all these storage projects being placed on homes. Um, but one thing that Darlene mentioned uh, about grid congestion that is also important here is that the front of the meter um, uh, market can really look at different places to place their battery, whether that's urban or rural, um, looking at nodes that have a lot of grid congestion. Um, there's a, just a lot of different areas and a lot of variability and a lot of flexibility in that regard. And that is what developers and IPPs certainly are looking for um, in order to make uh, just the best, you know, returns as possible on their asset. Excellent. And um, back to Darlene, interconnection delays have been a, a pretty persistent headwind, both for solar and storage and really any project being added to the grid. Um, how is the industry, how can the industry respond to this challenge and improve interconnection delays? Well, before I answer that GC question, I just want to close out with Gabe because I want to make sure I clarify um, my what I was saying earlier, which is, um, well, first, Gabe is absolutely correct. The, you know, just because a battery is charging from solar, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is an emissions reduction. That's a hard fact of, you know, how the grid works, um, which we we could have a whole nother panel on. To clarify my point about solar plus storage being a really powerful conversation, uh, really powerful combination was um, I was really drafting on G George's comments regarding how developers are looking at these projects from an economics perspective and pre standalone storage ITC, you know, they were getting that um, ITC if they were charging from solar. And so it made a much more powerful economic um, incentive for them to add storage. So don't disagree with anything that Gabe said, but I did want to make sure that I sort of put a bow on my previous comment. Um, so yeah, another juicy topic, in interconnection. Um, I, I would add permitting to that to that list because it's they're really so intertwined and it's been a problem for a very long time and certainly accelerating with with the clean energy adoption that we're seeing. And 
really the bottom line on on for me from a policy perspective on why it's such a thorny problem is because this stuff is regulated and crosses so many different jurisdictions it gets even messier right so you've got federal jurisdiction some places you've got local you've got regulatory commissions and and more so that's what makes both interconnection and permitting so challenging and um for in terms of what the industry can do i mean there's two pieces on that one is there is movement you know for 2023 is made some good first steps it's not all the way there but even you know imposing penalties uh, on people who aren't moving forward um and and also um looking at projects you know in a cluster um so you can really again be grid centric about about evaluations rather than a serial projects there's some good strides um there and a lot of the isos are doing their own work pgm is similarly moving from a you know first come first serve to a first ready approach. So those things are moving, not moving fast enough. But for me, this is where the industry, I know we at STEM, um, certainly I know George, we both serve on the board at Solar Electric Industries Association. Um, The the associations and, and the trade groups are critical in this work because of what I just referenced with all the overlapping jurisdictions. They can really be most effective um, in doing all of the multi layers of work that are required to to make changes um, to get clean energy on the grid faster. So I would encourage anyone in the industry um, get involved with those organizations. Advance Energy United is another uh, another organization doing great work across multiple levels because none of us alone can be um, as effective because we don't necessarily operate in all of those uh, jurisdictions. Thanks. And uh, for George, uh, another issue that we've seen, uh, especially at the utility scale for development, is uh, local opposition to development. I was wondering how Solve and and other industry members are, are dealing with the challenge of local opposition. Yeah, local opposition is something I think that, you know, we are seeing um, more and more um, as as kind of really well-funded um, opposition that almost represents itself oftentimes as local opposition. I think that part of that is the fact that we are succeeding as an industry and becoming part of a disruptor to um, conventional energy sources that now have to really look at how we're, you know, this growing industry and business. And this is one of the things that we talk a lot about um, at SIA is how are we going to get out and really win the win um, uh, from the IRA and the, and the promise that really is renewable energy in these communities. How does it bring good jobs and um, training and a, you know, long-term kind of job creation, right? A lot of times these projects um, are looked at as short-term construction jobs and that they're, you know, impactful uh, or they impact the local communities. They come in, they bring in a lot of workers and then, you know, go away. Well, in many communities, we're seeing that that's not the case, right? We have been creating energy hubs in many areas across the country where we have, you know, job over job over job for many, many years in the utility sector. And so we have, you know, we have areas where some of our workforce has been working for 10 years from home building solar projects. And so you know, there, you know, while we're seeing opposition, um, I think the reality is that most of these communities recognize the benefits, they recognize the economic impact, they recognize that they're in the front end of a, of a, of a new industry and a changing energy economy. And if we can get out and, and 
work together to send that message and really to, you know, to make meaningful impact. We spend a lot of time um, with our customer partners talking about how do we make lasting impacts? How do we go into, you know, local schools and educate the, you know, what is the workforce of tomorrow in what is a renewable energy job look like? And it's not just a construction job, you know, it, it, it really crosses all, um, you know, kind of every job classification, right? A lot of us, you know, we're talking about everything from, from, you know, installing out in the field to, you know, to government policy, right? And everywhere in between this industry crosses. And so there's opportunity for everybody. And I think if you get into these communities and you send the message that, you know, we're here to stay, this is good use of your, your, your land and your property, right? Not only from a revenue source, but from just a um, ability in most cases to keep it into, in, you know, in the family through long-term ground leases and revenue streams that may not be, you know, farming in some of these communities anymore, right? Families are changing, family farms are changing. So, you know, how do you maintain your, your land as well as be able to, um, you know, be able to, to profit from those. So I think those are things that um, we have to be able to do a better job of, of communicating and educating um, these communities and, and, Excellent. and, and really show that we're doing the right thing. Thank you, George. Really appreciate that. And lots to be excited about of the job creation and, and the value that's being delivered to these communities across the United States by solar and energy storage and all the connected technologies with it. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we have for time today. Um, thank you so much. This concludes our session. And I just want to thank each one of our panelists today uh, for your contributions. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Great thank to be you here. Right. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So we've just talked about how grid scale energy storage is meeting current challenges and continuing to ramp up to uh, meet the growing supply of renewable energy. And we've learned about the various ways it's evolving and changing and, and being used in, in different ways. Uh, stay tuned, because in our next upcoming session, we'll move forward with a, a distributed solar and energy storage talk, and we'll be looking at the state level policies that affect the market. Uh, we welcome four experts from Aurora Solar, CALSA, Sunnen, and Sunrun. Before that, we'll take a networking break. Take advantage of this time to connect with your peers and explore our platform's various networking features. And we'll see you back here on the stage at 3.30 Eastern.